Uh, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, thank you organizing committee uh, for this invite. Siesta time and I have been asked to speak on sleep and diabetes. Uh, one of an important but a less known uh, factor uh, which contributes as a risk factor for uh, developing type 2 diabetes is sleep and sleep disorders. So they have a negative effect as far as duration and quality of sleep is concerned and this can have detrimental effects with respect to uh, glucose metabolism and weight regulation. So therefore sleep um, education and management definitely would help us uh, with respect in prevention of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus. This is a brief overview of my talk and you can time your nap accordingly. Uh, insufficient sleep and the risk of obesity uh, and risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus, sleep disorders and diabetes, prevalence and impact of disease severity and management of diabetes, <coughs> sleep disorder, sorry. Uh, this is the behavioral definition of sleep. It's cyclical. There is reduced physical activity, stereotypic postures, reduced response to stimulation in reversible state. And these are some uh, stereotypical uh, postures uh, with various species and the lovely lady out there. And these are another stereotypical postures wherein we see young individuals, young healthy individuals, I would say, who are in deep sleep. And this actually forms an erratic sleep behavior, uh, which is a result of the lifestyle choices, a part of the modern society. Uh, and is associated with higher risk of uh, metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So if we look into the physiology of sleep, we all know we have REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Stage 3, stage 4 are considered to be restorative and refreshing. Uh, it helps us to restore the brain function. It also helps us to modulate a variety of uh, metabolic endocrine and uh, CVS systems. During the non-REM sleep, there is a decrease in the metabolic rate uh, the SNS or sympathetic nervous system activity, blood pressure pulse, and increase in the cardiac vehicle activity. So sleep uh, per se is a byproduct of uh, two process, process C and process S uh, respectively, uh, a sleep homeostasis and the circadian part. And uh, the pressure for sleep increases in proportion to the duration of wakefulness. So the human behavior may override these physiological control mechanisms uh, or when the behavior, behavioral sleep-wake cycle is not in synchrony with the biological uh, circadian timing system, then what is called as a circadian misalignment, uh, this may result in alterations of sleep duration and quality. So if we look into this particular zone out there, this is the sine wave and there's a dip out there during the daytime and this actually corresponds to your siesta time. So there is a numerous, uh, there is enough uh, papers which have been published with uh, respect to sleep restriction and sleep fragmentation and hypoxia. Uh, and they, they all have said that there is reduction in insulin sensitivity. Insufficient sleep has been linked to the reduced uh, insulin sensitivity to a tune of around 24%. And there is an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. A state of sleep depth uh, caused by decrease in insulin sensitivity that was not compensated by an increase in insulin release leads to more than 40% decrease in glucose tolerance compared to fully rested condition. Sleep fragmentation is also a poor hallmark of poor sleep quality and the insulin sensitivity reduces by almost 25%. So this is the sleep depth protocol and uh, here the patients with uh, young, healthy, lean, uh, normal individuals were enrolled and they were actually subjected to first eight hours of sleep uh, for the first three days and then the sleep was curtailed to four hours of bedtime, that is the sleep depth and finally for over a period of six days and then finally for the next seven days, uh, they were given an extra four hours uh, of sleep, which, uh, which means around 12 hours of bedtime. And this is the impact of the sleep depth on the leptin and ghrelin. We all know the satiety hormone and the hunger hormone. The leptin levels are elevated during uh, sleep under physiological conditions. When the sleep was restricted, the mean leptin levels were around 19% lower during the sleep restriction. And this resulted in uh, overeating because there was elevated intergranin levels and this increased rate, uh, hunger and appetite. And there was a 33% increase in appetite for carbohydrate-rich diet. So sleep deprivation in this control study might represent a risk factor for overeating and eventually weight gain or obesity. To follow up, there was another study which confirmed the findings of the, uh, the sleep depth study. And this is for two days of four hours in bed versus two days of 10 uh, hours in bed. And you can see out there uh, the purple bar out here the leptin and the ghrelin, <clears throat> the leptin levels were on the lesser side and the ghrelin levels were on the higher side. There was increased hunger and appetite. So impact of, uh, we have laboratory studies and epidemiological studies and the differences in these, uh, despite differences in the study design, uh, there are the two studies are amicably concordant in a finding 
that there is decrease in the satiety hormone leptin and an increase in the appetite stimulating uh, ghrelin with short sleep. Moving on, the, the studies initially were all uh, looking into the calories consumed, but there is now more research with respect to the calories spent or the energy expenditure. And short sleep duration increases the energy intake with respect to carbohydrates and fat. But in this particular study, it was seen that the calories spent was almost non-significant out there. And this is what happens, and this actually, when left untreated and not compensated by increased energy expenditure, the dietary intake of individuals undergoing short sleep uh, may predispose to obesity. So alterations of sleep duration, chronic sleep restriction, fragmentation, excessive sleep, circadian rhythm disorders and disruption, and obstructive sleep apnea, they all contribute to what is sleep disturbances uh, and obesity. This particular animation uh, is very important with respect to insulin sensitivity and the, uh, the insulin secretion because it talks about normoglycemia and dysglycemia. Uh, whenever there is uh, insulin sensitivity decreases, the beta cells actually uh, compensate by increasing the insulin secretion and therefore it helps us to maintain normoglycemia. However, if and when the insulin uh, secretion is unable to compensate for the decreased insulin sensitivity, then the curve shifts towards the left and uh, we have impaired glucose tolerance or dysglycemia. So we have a transition from normoglycemia to dysglycemia and finally to diabetes. So this is again the impact of the, uh, sh uh, the sleep depth study uh, with the, uh, the IV glucose tolerance stress and you can see that there is reduced uh, insulin sensitivity and the beta cells fail to increase the insulin response or compensate and therefore there is a decreased insulin response and therefore there is a decrease in the disposition index. So disposition index is, uh, has an uh, inverse relationship, lesser the disposition index, higher will be the uh, greater will be the chance of uh, an individual developing diabetes. And there are other studies which have also confirmed similar findings. So there is a good consistency in these laboratory studies uh, wherein enrolled people with normal glucose tolerance at baseline become pre-diabetic uh, after sleep manipulation. This is a systemic review and meta-analysis uh, talking about uh, short sleep, long sleep, uh, individuals who are having difficulty in uh, initiating sleep and difficulty in maintaining sleep. And each of these uh, studies and the various studies have shown that there is a relative risk of developing diabetes right from anywhere from 28% to 84%. So the, uh, the, the relative risk of incident diabetes in these individuals with short sleep duration or reporting difficulty in initiating or maintaining sleep is of the same order of magnitude as the relative risk imparted by having family history of type 2 diabetes, usually considered as one of the strongest predictors of diabetes risk. Now, moving on to sleep disorders and diabetes, the prevalence and impact of disease severity. Uh, given the fact that there is a good association between uh, sleep disorders and development of type 2 diabetes, the prevalence of these disorders, that is obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, or restless syndrome, that is what we would look into as of now, would definitely be higher in individuals with type 2 diabetes mellitus having type 2 diabetes as compared with general population. So insomnia is characterized by difficulty in initiating and maintaining sleep or by waking up earlier than desired despite adequate opportunity or to sleep. So in these in patients with insomnia, the sleep opportunity is adequate. However, the sleep ability is reduced. Whereas individuals having sleep loss or sleep depreciation would have reduced uh, sleep opportunity, but their ability is adequate. So obstructive sleep apnea, uh, a sleep-related breathing disorder is characterized by complaints such as non-restorative sleep, sleepiness or snoring, accompanied by recurrent episodes of partial or upper airway obstruction during the sleep. And these are the potential mechanisms which link sleep apnea to the alterations in glucose metabolism. Intermittent hypoxia and sleep fragmentation are the cardinal features of obstructive sleep apnea, and they are likely to uh, likely in the causal uh, pathway leading to metabolic dysfunction along with low amounts of slow wave sleep and reduced total sleep time. These are experimental studies mimicking the impact of components of uh, these components of on insulin sense of OSA on insulin sensitivity, and you can see that individuals having uh, reduced slow wave sleep suppression or having sleep fragmentation or uh, those who are subjected to intermittent hypoxia uh, had reduced insulin sensitivity as compared to those individuals having normal sleep or normoxia. 118 uh, data from 118 non-diabetic subjects who underwent uh, polysomnography and frequent sampling intravenous uh, glucose tolerance test. And you can see as the obstructive sleep apnea increases from mild, moderate and severe the, uh, the reduction, there is a reduction in the insulin sensitivity right from around 26% to 36 to 43% respectively, independent of age. 
gender and uh, the presence of body fat. There's a bidirectional link between obesity and type 2 diabetes uh, and obstructive sleep apnea. OSA causes intermittent hypoxia sleep fragmentation results in obesity and type 2 diabetes and uh, these can have direct uh, weight related dependent effects and indirect uh, weight dependent effects. Uh, with uh, respect to weight uh, dependent mechanisms, we have increased in the mechanical load narrowed uh, airway and that is a part because of the accumulation of adipose tissue. The indirect weight dependent mechanisms include hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia and rapid resistance uh, are metabolic and hormonal alterations very common in obesity and type 2 diabetes and can contribute to uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in type 2 is exceptionally high and uh, data from these seven studies, the weighted average is around 68%, meaning that two out of three individuals with type 2 diabetes actually have this comorbidity and most of the time neither them or the doctor know about it. This is the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea with different uh, disease conditions and the epidemic of diabetes is associated with the epidemic of obstructive sleep apnea. This is the impact of obstructive sleep apnea on glycemic control and as we see that the mild, moderate and severe, uh, as it increases with severity, patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus will have poor glucose control or poor glycemic control. To summarize, uh, the summary of the literature to date on association of sleep disorders with health outcomes and quality of life, if you look into sleep insomnia, it has an effect on glycemia, it increases the risk of retinopathy, it increases depression and possibly and, uh, decreases the quality of life. With obstructive sleep apnea, there is, uh, there is effects on glycemia, uh, micro and macrovascular complications, mortality and quality of life. Uh, restless leg syndrome doesn't seem to be affecting much of the uh, glycemic effect, but definitely has effect on micro and macrovascular complications. No effect it on as far as mortality, but decreases the quality of life. So a uh, summary of the possible pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment options for sleep disorders in people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, looking into um, uh, insomnia, we have the selective orexin receptor antagonist, uh, which shows uh, improved sleep quality. Estesolome improved sleep, but there was no effect on the glycemia. Then we have hypnotics, which have been used, but uh, they have shown improved in sleep and fasting glucose. There is off-label use of uh, antidepressants and uh, antipsychotics with known metabolic side effects. And with respect to melatonin, there have only been two studies which have shown improved in sleep and A1C, and uh, the treatment is still controversial and generally not recommended for treatment. For restless leg syndrome, for the restless leg syndrome, the drug of choice is uh, premipexol, which is a dopamine agonist, and the other pharmacological agents uh, mentioned uh, have either not been approved or not given very good results with, in treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes for health outcomes. CPAP remains the gold standard for treating OSA, but the effects on health outcomes in people with type 2 diabetes are inconsistent, possibly because of the poor disease state adherence to CPAP. Uh, CPAP being used early in the first half of the night when the non-rapid eye movement sleep dominates, while specifically it's the REM sleep apnea in the later half, which can cause adverse associated with uh, glycemic control. There have been mandibular assisted devices which have also been used in the management of uh, the obstructive sleep apnea, but there is no head-on comparison between sleep apnea and the mandibular assisted devices. So as of now, CPAP seems to have positive effect of, on sleep quality, blood pressure, quality of life and depression, which in turn could improve type 2 diabetes management and prevent comorbidities. There is one paper with dapagliflozine being used in obstructive sleep apnea in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Despite that there was no effect with respect to the uh, glycemia or A1C, there was weight loss and this weight loss, uh, which was achieved regardless of the mechanism, has in, uh, was successful treatment for management of OSA uh, in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Major questions which I would love to hear from my seniors and my colleagues present out here. Does effective treatment of OSA improve glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes? Or does effective treatment of OSA prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes in patients with pre-diabetes? And I keep it open for discussion later on. With respect to sleep hygiene, these are the do's and don'ts. Um, so establish a regular bedtime, rise time. I think the last one as far as do's, putting the cell phone in silent off mode is very much important when we try to go to sleep. Don'ts again. Uh, eating too spicy foods in the night or trying too hard to sleep or late night television watching or phone calls. Uh, these are a list of it and very well uh, published in the IJM. 
Uh, sleep disruption is very much common during pregnancy because of various physical and hormonal changes and can have important implications for maternal and fetal health. We are concerned with gestational diabetes mellitus and pregnant women with advanced maternal age, higher BMI, self-reported frequent snoring should be assessed for sleep disordered breathing. Uh, these are the treatment recommendations for gestational OSA with respect to uh, CPAP. Uh, recommendations in sleep disordered breathing and uh, if the AHI is more than apnea hypnea index is more than 15 with respect to sleep hygiene recommendation if the uh, if the female has a mild OSA obstructive sleep apnea and oral appliances surgical procedures and supplemental oxygen should not has not been approved uh, to be used during pregnancy. The ADA says uh, the association between the sleep disorders and diabetes are complex and the sleep disorders are a risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes mellitus and possibly GDM. So we need to be more vigilant. So uh, type 2 diabetes and sleep disorders are common problems that often coexist. There is a high prevalence of sleep disorders in people with type 2, which can be detrimental to their health, mood, and quality of life. Conversely, the sleep orders, including OSA, are themselves predisposed to higher risk of metabolic disorders, uh, including type 2 diabetes. And all patients with type 2 diabetes should be screened for sleep disorders as a part of routine clinical practice and treated appropriately. Thank you very much for your patient listening.